everyone, this is Kate Shutt. I'm on the Nebula Music Podcast, and I'm super happy to be here. Exactly. Miss Kate Shutt, thank you so much for being on the show. I know you're doing well. You're in San Diego, but you are from New York. Yeah. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're here on the show. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here. I'm curious. <laughs> it's, this has been a bizarre year for everybody. And I've been doing my part asking every every artist has come through the show, just like to give me a brief little lowdown of how it's been going. This year mm -hmm. has been strange for every single musician, whether it's been mm -hmm. good or bad. Some people have found it incredibly creative. Some people have unfortunately dealt with some personal stuff. For you specifically, how has this pandemic been and how are you handling it? Are you excited to be out of it or almost out of it? <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, um, I think for me, the pandemic was like this great um, time of creativity. It was like a it was like a, a boost of energy for me. Mm. Um, it unleashed a lot of things for me, um, which was cool and unexpected. You know, I didn't really I mean, I was. I, I, I wrote out the beginning of the pandemic in New York and like full lockdown and, yeah. um, you know, in, 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 and so it was, it was, while it was scary and, um, you know, worrisome on all those levels, but, um, but personally, um, like musically for me and create creatively, it was, it was a, it was a big, there was a lot of energy created. Yeah. So, um, you know, going to, doing a lot of streaming concerts, a lot of time for co-writing, um, a lot of, a lot of friendships that I have really great friendships, um, with touring musicians whom, you know, finally they were in one place. Yeah. Like, yeah. So a couple of my, um, friend, deep friendships that were already really, really deep got even deeper because for once they, you know, I wasn't trying to catch them between Rome and, um, Yugoslavia or like, you know, like it's just very hard when, when your best friends are, you know, sort of the, at the top of their game and they're touring all the time, it's hard to, hard to keep track of them. So for me, like my friendships really deepened in a lot of ways too, yeah. which was surprising. I don't think any of us kind of anticipated and, that. Yeah. yeah. And also like we, it wasn't like we were together, like we were zooming and we were FaceTiming and we were talking on the phone. Well, I think it showed every, I mean, even though I feel like we all know this on some subconscious level, I think it just demonstrated how much people long for interaction, how difficult it would be to become like a hermit and not see anybody for years. You know <laughs> totally. what I mean? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I felt like the, um, I don't know, for me, like the whole streaming thing, I think I would have been much more precious about it had it not been the pandemic. Like, trying mm. to get things perfect and make it look great. And like, as soon as the lockdown started, it was like, fuck it. I'm getting online to play some music for people. Cause people need some music, you know? And it was like, yeah. who cares if it's zoom and nobody knows how to work to zoom yet. And what the hell is original sound? And how do you know, like, how do you make this thing? How do you make it not sound like shit? Well, it did kind of sound like shit for the first like three months. And then we all yeah. sort of figured it out, but no one cared. Like we were just happy to see someone playing music. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the whole live streaming thing, that was a, I remember I, I play for a lot of the, the, the bigger churches here in LA. And yeah. I remember across the board, almost everybody, even from the biggest churches to like the smallest place, even just venues, I just call them venues. Yeah. Um, everyone just struggled getting that whole live stream perfectly. And then I feel like now it's become a staple of what we're doing. I, I do feel totally. like live streaming may not take a dip, but it may kind of settle down a little bit once everything goes back to normal because everyone is longing to go out. You yeah, know what I mean? Totally. So we're definitely going to experience a boom in live concerts. Oh, I can't but, wait. But, you know, like live wait. streaming is kind of here to stay. And I'm I very happy. Yeah. I think I agree with you. I'm 100%. I mean, why wouldn't it be part of the mix? You know, why wouldn't it be yep. an arrow in your quiver? Um, you know, you may be touring, but you also may be doing a lot of live streaming, too, for people that can't come to your show for many reasons. You know, like maybe yeah. there's maybe, you know, not not only just access, like, you know, but like. It, it, I mean, there's just so many reasons why I don't think it should go away now that we finally figured out how to do it. <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> it's one of those things where we had to figure it out on the fly. One thing I'm curious about, if you don't mind me mm -hmm. kind of picking your sure. brain a little bit on this, totally. you did mention how you feel like during the pandemic, a lot of creative things came out, maybe even some other things you may never have been able mm -hmm. to deal with came out. But then mm -hmm. you mentioned friends as well. And, you mm -hmm. know, part of the touring world, that is 
one of those things where it's a little difficult because everyone is constantly traveling, which is an awesome thing, but you're right. right. Everyone's kind of zoom, zooming in and out of the cities or whatever. Totally. In your experience, I'm wondering, did you feel like your circle got a little smaller though? And uh, the reason why I'm asking this is I've had several people on the show mm -hmm. who have, ex and myself too, I'm going to put myself out there too. Sure. My circle definitely got smaller and that's because not a direct choice, so to speak. I think the pandemic for me and others that have been on the show have shared how it's really taught them what they really want out of relationships in mm. general, mm. because they were forced to confront that every single day for like 12 months. <laughs> and so I found that to be a common theme with a lot of musicians like yourself who are touring and stuff that they realize like, hey, you know, I love having acquaintances. I love having connections, but who are my real people that are in my corner. So I'm wondering for you specifically, do you feel like that happened? It's okay if it didn't. I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, I think it's a really interesting question. I think for me, it didn't happen, but only because, you know, I spent five years as my mom's primary caregiver and I, mm. I put music away basically for five years and was doing that job. And, um, you know, when you're in extremis as a, you know, as a primary caregiver and like, uh, you know, I, I, it, that really, that really taught me who my friends were because there mm. wasn't a, there wasn't a way, you know, if people wanted to be in touch with me, they had, they really had to be because I wasn't doing music. I wasn't seeing them around. I wasn't, you know, talking to them about gigs or asking them for advice about this. And it was like, and also, and, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a rough patch in your life, like that's also a time when you notice that, you know, who's, who's really showing up, who's, who's taking the time to be in touch and say, Hey, you know, I know, I know you're going through something tough and I just wanted to reach out and say hi. Yeah. And so I think had I not done that, probably the pandemic would have been that for me, but I, it was sort of, I had already done that. So for me, I think, like I said, the pandemic sort of opened up, I think some people who, you know, just because they're through just their their bandwidth or their focus got a little, the, the pandemic allowed them to focus on like relationships. And so they, I think they sort of met me where I was in, mm. in terms of wanting more from our relationship. You've been there for a while. Mm -hmm. You've been there for, and I, I think yeah. that's, that's just part of growing up. I do feel like uh, a lot of people, if you choose to confront that, you do get to that point. And that this is actually something I wanted to talk to you about. And I'm glad that you brought it up because mm. This is part of the reason why your story is fascinating, but mm. it's also one of those things that a lot of people have to go through. So in, in a sense, you're, you're shining a light on something that I think most people never want to deal with. But, you know, if we're being honest, odds are at some point, a lot of us will have to deal with something maybe not as we're maybe mortal. not as hectic. Exactly. We're mortal. <laughs> we're all <And> mortal. <laughs> can I, if you don't mind walking me through a little bit, of I know course. it might be painful, but what, no. what was going on in your mother's life? And maybe mm -hmm. you can walk me through a little bit what led you to decide that you needed to transition to become her permanent caregiver for five mm -hmm. years, I think it was, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I was, I had been living in Canada and making music up there from 2000, around 2004 to 2010. And then I had moved back. I had moved to the United States. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm American. I was living up there working and I had come back and had just moved to New York and was like really getting my feet under me in terms of the scene and meeting people and like, you know, starting to really, you know, make a, establish myself a little bit. And then, um, you know, just bad luck, really. My mom, my mom hadn't been feeling well and, uh, and uh, got the results of a CAT scan and, and just, you know, basically what, what was happening was that she had a tumor the size of a grapefruit in her abdomen and Ugh. they did the, the biopsy on it and, you know, came back, uh, um, ovarian cancer stage three C. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, it's a really hard to talk about, but it's like, I did make a decision, um, to move home and be her primary caregiver, but it never felt like a decision. Um, my mom is an amazing person and, and, you know, it was like, she, this, this happened and it was like, right. Okay. I'll be right back. Let me go up to New York. Let me like deal with my stuff and I'll be back tomorrow to live here and help you go through this. Um, 
so it was a decision. Obviously, everything in life is a decision. Um, even deciding yeah. not to decide something is a decision. So it was a decision, but it was also just like a calling. Like it was just, there was just no doubt in my mind that I was going to show up for my mom in that way. Um, yeah. Were you so, guys close for many of your for her I mean, whole life? Yeah. I, but I wouldn't say that we were like really Best friends. close. I mean, yeah, I, no, my, my, my parents were my parents. Like we had a very healthy relationship, you know, um, I had been living, I mean, I went away to boarding school because I, because I did and because I wanted to play women's ice hockey. And so I hadn't been living at home since I was 14. And wow. so I wasn't close in that way. You know, it was just, just my mom was a person I loved and respected. And this was a really fucking shitty roll of the dice. And yeah. I wanted to be there for her. And it just wasn't, it was just what I was going to do. So, you know, I didn't know at the time, like, oh, it would last five years. And oh, I would actually not pick up my guitar for a year and a half and all those kinds of things. So, so that, you know, had I known all that, would I have done it? I, yeah, I, st- I definitely would have done it. But, um, uh, you know, you don't know those things. You make a decision and then you roll with the punches. So, so yeah. I, so I lived at home um, and she had to go immediately into a major debulking surgery, which is where they basically like take everything out that they can take out and, and then start frontline chemo right away. And, you know, that's just grim. It's just, it's just grim. And I have a dad and he was there and I lived at home in one of my, ch- in one of our childhood bedrooms. Um, and, you know, my dad's a great guy and an amazing guy. And definitely my wingman, but he's an old school dad. You know, he wasn't capable of like dealing with the kinds of decisions that needed to be right. made. Right. Um, so I did all that and um, yeah, it was just rough. It's just day in, day out, you know, going to the hospital every other day, dealing with the after effects of chemo, you know, make, trying to get her to eat something as she's losing weight and, you know, um, all those things. And then eventually she went into a remission about a year and a half into it, which Mm. was amazing. And, um, I got the chance to go away and start writing. So I had, I put my guitar down. I mean, I literally didn't pick it up, um, during that first year and a half, but I kept notes about like what was going on. And thank God I did, because that was like, once I got the chance to get back to my guitar and start writing songs, I had all this material that I was like, yo, yeah, I want to write a song about that. And I want to write a song about that. And oh, yeah, there's that. And so I just opened up those notebooks and started started working. And I was able to write, I think on that first time away, I was able to write four or five songs and came mm-hmm. back and played them for her. Oh, that must have been nice. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it kind of was like that. Then she'd go, then she got, had a recurrence and then we'd be, then I'd just focus on caregiving for another year. And then she went into another mission and I got another bit of time to go write some more songs and until kind of maybe about her last, I don't know, year and a half when, when things were just going downhill and, you know, I just was just doing that and doing the hospice thing. And, um, yeah. yeah. And then she died in 2015 and I, um, you know, took some time to be with my dad and just get him sorted and get the ship righted and sailing forward. Right. Um, and then, and then really started in earnest to write the rest of the songs. There was a lot of things that I wanted to say that I couldn't really say until she was gone, just because mm. I, I wanted to be in her perspective and I couldn't be in her shoes while she was still in her own shoes. Really? You know? Why did you yeah. feel like that? That's that's interesting because I feel like some and again, I don't I'm not saying I'm an expert in this field whatsoever, yeah. Yeah. but I as someone who doesn't know, I feel like one would argue that you probably could a little bit while she was still alive and maybe processing uh, going through that process, but you chose until everything was all said and done, which is probably the better thing to do. Yeah. Why do you why do you feel like you couldn't express what you were feeling at that time and needed to wait till the very end? I mean, there was certainly you know, seven or eight songs that I wrote before that she heard before she died. The rest of them, um, the ones that are specifically from her perspective, I don't know. It was just this gut thing. Like I wanted to write, there's a song on the album called square by square. And it's about this thing. So when my mom got the diagnosis, I, I, I said to her, I was like, look, we're not going to mince words here. This is the thing that's going to kill you. It's, it's either going to kill you 
you know, a month from now, or it's going to kill you five years, you know, two years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, but you are going to die from this aggressive form of ovarian cancer. Like, you know, this, she, she just had a very aggressive form of it and her doctor gave her max two years to live. So it was like, it was like, this is going to kill you, whether it kills you now or later. So let's not mince words because there's no point. Let's just, let's, let's, um, maximize your quality of life. And so, um, so I said, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to go travel? You know, when you're better, do you want to go travel? Do you want to see people? Who do you want to see? Who don't you want to see? Like you've got limited time on this earth and you know it. So what do you want to do? And she, she looked at me dead in the eye. This was like the day she got the diagnosis and she looked at me dead in the eye and she was like, I want to organize the goddamn family photos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your mom sounds awesome. Holy shit. That's, that is yeah. awesome. Right. So that's the kind of person my mom was. And so we started this huge project, which was really actually incredibly profound. And she had been the, the, the documentarian for her family and yeah. for our family when she married my dad and, and my brothers and I. And so we had box. The reason why I didn't live in my childhood bedroom is because there were boxes and boxes of photographs in my childhood bedroom. So I had to live in my brother's bedroom, one of my brother's bedrooms. And so, right. She got through her surgery. She started chemo. So I pulled, I I set up this desk outside the kitchen, like right, right near the kitchen. And every, you know, couple weeks I'd bring down a box and, and in the afternoons, like right before she would take her nap, or whenever she really had the energy, um, she would sit there and like sort through the photos. Mm. And I mean, just think about it. You know, you're going to die. And you're looking at your entire life from your childhood, which she inherited all those photos from her mother. Nobody had organized them. Your childhood all the way through the family that you created with your dad, with your husband until 2007 when my mom got her first iPhone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so no more physical photos. Fo- wow, that's cool. no more that's physical cool. photos. At 2007, it cuts off. Wow. But, so she sat there and and organized them and sorted through them and like you know would find these hilarious ones and like send them to cousins with a note and you know and and that I was like I gotta write about this because like who fucking does this? Who does this? Like no one does this. No one has the strength. I wouldn't have had the strength to do it. No freaking mm. way. So like, that was a song I knew I had to write, but like, man, it was hard to find a way in. Yeah. I I couldn't find a way in until I'd seen her do that whole thing. And luckily she got it done right before she went into hospice. And we were, she was in hospice for quite a while, like three or four months, which was awesome and amazing, but she got it done like right before she died essentially. And so, you know, that, that's an example of a song that like, how do you write about this profound experience? Yeah. From her perspective, you know, do it justice. Yeah. You know, not make it trite and, 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 and like pointless. Like, you know, it's not, it's not like, Oh, here I am looking at some family photos. Like this is, this is a really profound, and you're looking at photos of people who've died, people who, you know, you've loved and lost, you know, it's, it's just, it was just crazy. So that was an example of a song that I could, I literally could not write until she was gone because I don't know. It's just so hard to find a way in. Right. You know, I, I don't think it's something that many of us could imagine uh, un- unless we go through it. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. y- that story is so fascinating. You know what it reminds me of? And it mm-hmm. might not even be super similar to it, but I'm not sure you might have heard of this story. But there was this photographer who lived in New York his whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think at the age of 20 or something like that, he started taking Polaroids every day, like just of something random of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is like back in the, I think early nineties or late eighties. And then he, he passed away maybe like early two thousands because of cancer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is like before cell phones, before right. any of that. So this guy like went out of his way to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating to see the collection of photos that this person took and to see the life of someone who most of us never met, no, never right. will, you know, have no reason to know, but this guy went out of his way to, to document. And I could be speaking out of terms here, but I just, I do feel like hearing your story of your mom, I think a lot of people would be like, well, yeah, if I was about to pass away, I would go to the most lucrative trip I could go. I could exactly. go do this. Right. You know, there's this concept of doing. And I part of me wonders if 
obviously we all deal with it differently or would deal with it differently. But a part of me wonders if there's a sort of level of just, um, I don't want to say acceptance, but appreciation over um, rather than trying to go do something random, maybe there's just this level of like, let me be grateful for everything that's happened till now. And maybe there's this like that's this level of just, I don't know, I'm speaking out of my ass here, <laughs> to yeah. be honest with you. But it's incredible because well, you're right. I think, you know, I think my mom was an, uh, an incredibly practical person. And mm. my mom was also a person who took responsibility very seriously. Yeah. And she felt as if she didn't want to leave that job to someone else. It was her job, you know, and, and, and that was something that she could do hopefully before she passed that then my brothers and I wouldn't have to do, or, I mean, she had a, that wasn't the only thing. Like there was that, there was like, I want to do this and this thing to the house. And, you know, there was like a list that we created of things that she wanted to do. And none of them were like, oh yeah, I want to go see the, the pyramids in Egypt, or I want to go, you know, stay at the Ritz or something like that. None of it was not, none of it was like that. She was just a very, she always thought of other people. And I think what she wanted to, where, where she wanted to be when she died was like, okay, I've taken care of the things that I can take care of. Mm. You know, it's I clear she knew what she, of... she knew what she wanted. She knew what she yeah. liked. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. For sure. And that, I mean, that's, that's who she was. And that's why it was such a privilege and an honor to go through that experience with her because she really, you can imagine someone being, you know, so, me saying that me saying or having someone say to you like look we're gonna look death straight in the eye like we're not gonna mince words we're not gonna dance around about this you know um and you could imagine someone being terrified of that and that that not going well well you know but my mom rose to the occasion i mean she planned yeah. her we she planned her funeral you know um wow that takes so, some guts planning yeah. your own funeral wow yeah so um you know it was just like, it was an, and I realize I am so lucky, like to do, to have that experience. Not a lot of people have that experience that, um, you know, that, that she met me, that that's mm -hmm. what I, that's what I, um, I, you know, I was there walking her through that and with her on that. And then she met me there. And that's just, yeah. that's just incredibly rare. It's yeah. incredibly rare. You know what? I, I know we, I, I want to talk a little bit more about your music, but mm -hmm. I wanted to bring this up because this was a profound experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, and if it helps anyone out there, hopefully it does. But yeah, it was um, not that long ago. I want to say maybe like two years ago or something before the pandemic, I was, uh, I was on set doing a shoot and uh, my, ha my uh, hairdresser um, for that day Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got, you get to talking to people when you're sitting totally. in a chair for hours. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she sure. was doing my, she was doing my hair. And then after talking, you know, she mentions about her, her, her husband who had passed away a couple of years prior. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit younger, so I don't know a lot about death and I'm just mm -hmm. asking her questions about it. And her answers, I, one thing I picked up on was how, uh, how do I say it? Okay, I guess at the end, I basically just asked her, hey, are you looking to like remarry? Like, what's your plan? I don't know. And she's like, no, you know, like one, once is good enough for me. Mm. And that answer really stuck with me, not because of what she said, but because of how she said it. And I picked mm. up that throughout the whole entire we were talking about her husband, there was a sense of pain, obviously, because he was gone, but this overwhelming level of gratitude mixed with it. And I don't know why, but that day I walked away with, I think I understood what a good example of mourning was when I, mm -hmm. when I met this person, because her life basically taught me that we all go through painful things. We all go through shitty things that we didn't ask for, but they're going to happen in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the best thing to do is what this person did. I can't remember her name. Otherwise I would give her credit. But yeah. when she talked about her husband, she talked about it in a way where like, yeah, it sucks that he's gone, but how lucky was I that we got right. to meet? and like hang out together. And I think that says a lot, you know, in, mm -hmm. in something that we can do in our life when we go through shitty things or lose things or whatever is maybe flip the coin a little bit. It sounds super cliche, but I don't know. Like there's something to that. And I think your mom, um, it's very clear that, that she knew exactly what was important to her. And even facing death, 
um, not wavering from that and just being mm-hmm. like, I know what I want. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to change that because death is at the door. Right. How, how brave is that? Like, that's, that's fat. That's awesome. You yeah. I, I think your point is a really good one in, in that, like, you know, you, you can, yes, you're sad that the person's gone and you don't have, you don't, you can't make new memories with them, but you know, you can stay in touch with all the things they did give you and all yeah. the time you did have together. And that never goes anywhere. No one can take all of that away from you. You know, yeah. no one can take any of that away from you. And I think, I mean, back to your point about, um, you know, how did you make that decision? Why did you make that decision? I think if anything, it, it was like, I knew I never wanted to look back and say, I wish I had mm. at that time. I just knew like, I, 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 in my mind, I fast forwarded myself to like the end of this. And was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be in a place where I'm saying like, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with her. I wish I had done X. I wish I had done Y. Yeah. Um, and so with that as like the kind of dark side of the light side, you know, it was like, I just used that as my kind of gut check and then went all in and, yeah, you know, and, it, and let it unfold really. Yeah. You know, one thing I'm curious about is I know that when tragedy strikes, um, we can't possibly know how we're going to behave. No one can. Totally. You know, we, we know, 100%. we know exactly. Like we're all different and we all think we might know, but at the end of the day, instincts take over. Right. Yeah. And what's fascinating is I do feel like a lot of people would do the same thing you did, which if, if you're focusing on helping someone who's you know going to be gone, you might not think about anything else. And, and like you, you didn't feel like touching music for a while. And then mm-hmm. later you picked it back up and there was a mm-hmm. big source of inspiration there for you. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it was important for you not to do music? Obviously, like we've been talking about, it wasn't even a thought you just did it. And, yeah. you know, that was that. But looking back at it now, personally, I feel like it was the right thing to do and, and it helped you in some sort of way. But I mm-hmm. think a lot of people would, you know, consider the opposite. Like music is such an escape that it might help you right, deal yeah, like with, with pain. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So for you specifically, why was it a benefit to not do that for years? Well, I don't I wouldn't call it a benefit. I think it was just a survival thing. I mean, you know, to be truthful, Eddie, it was like the day-to-day care for a person who's going through that thing, you know, is so overwhelming. I mean, from the second I got up basically to the second I put her in bed, there was something to be done. You know, there was some life, like seemingly huge life decision to be made about like, should we do this kind of chemo and should you do this? Like, you know, mm. where, I'm, where I'm, I mean, I'm the, imagine this is, I'm not, I don't have children, but it's what a parent feels like, you know, like you're making yeah. decisions for this person. And so it was that, it was like big, big questions like that to like, how am I going to get her to eat more because she needs to eat, but she's, you know, every time she gets near food, she's nauseous. And so, you know, some, some nights I'd have to cook like three dinners because like, this one made her feel like she was going to throw up this one. She got wow. one, one bite down this one. Oh, this one worked, you know? Um, so for me, there was just, and then I'd like go into my room and see my guitar there and be like, I don't know, for me, my relationship to the music at that point was so. Well, it changed like overnight. Yeah. It was just like, I just felt like it, it wasn't um, a, for me, it wasn't a source of, comfort at that point it was like Mm. only to remind me of how much I wasn't doing Mm. and that was not healthy to to, do was not healthy for me to be in that space because you know I have friends who meanwhile are like making albums and rocketing to the top of the charts and like it's like oh yeah and here I am literally changing my mother's diaper like that doesn't make you feel too great you know, to be yeah. like, oh yeah, there's those like friends of mine that are like pursuing their life dreams. And I'm over here, like, you know, I'll spare you some more of the details, but like <laughs> that, <Yeah. laughs> that type of like, you know, that for me, that was not healthy mental. That was not a, it, to, 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 to be involved in music at that point was not a healthy thing. It would just serve only to remind me of what, what I wasn't doing at the time. Mm. And so um, I just made the decision 
to not go there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, I've evolved a lot spiritually and mentally um, and attitudinally around music um, since then. And, and my relationship to it is much different is I think a lot different now in, in that if this happened again, I would have a different, I would probably, I could probably balance it a little bit more and bring it more into my life. But at yeah. that point I didn't have the resources to do well, it. And it was a, only a self-punishing thing. Well, yeah. I mean, we all deal with things the way that we can as best as we possibly can. And totally. I mean, hearing your story, I feel like it, it's not that it was the uh, the right move. I mean, in those experiences, there is no right or wrong move in right. my humble opinion. You just I do agree. what you have to do. And clearly, mm -hmm. in my opinion, humble opinion, you did do the right <laughs> thing by taking care of your mom. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's what I think I would want to do as well. And it can be tough in general. I mean, I, I witness this a lot in younger artists and people that come to the show or people that mm -hmm. just talk to um, that idea of... of um, comparison you know like you just mentioned you know watching other people succeed and 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 losing their 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 shit because someone <laughs> is is succeeding you know and i can only imagine the pain that you would feel you doing what you have to mm -hmm. and, and then not being able to do what you love and to be fair i do feel like there's a lot of people out there too in different scenarios who whether they're taking care of a family or, or doing hard work or whatever they, right. they can't focus on music i i think your story is interesting in the sense where you went through something traumatic that I don't wish on anybody mm -hmm. and you took care of it. And I do feel like in our society, and I don't want to get too far into like this whole <laughs> philosophical talk, but yeah. I do feel like we are, we have this culture where because we constantly see the final product all the time from what everybody else is doing and we don't see what goes into a lot of that final product, it can fuck with you mentally. Totally. And I, I think your life story is an example of somebody who dealt with the hand they were given with and then came back to it a lot stronger, mm -hmm. um, different, spiritually different with way more life experience and created something beautiful out of it. You just, you did what you had to. And that's, I love that. I love that part of your story. I think it's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. You know, um, my life coach at one point, you know, it wasn't like I put the guitar away and I never struggled ever again during that time. Like there would be, you know, times where I'd really get down on myself and be like, why can't I even pick it up for 10 minutes and play? And like, and I remember at one point, my life coach, John Morgan said to me, he said, be the family, Kate, be the family, hmm. which, which it was in one of these periods of real, like inner turmoil and struggle. And, and, um, and it was like the second I, the second I really committed to being the family, like that, that's what I was doing. It was like all that struggle went away. Were you afraid of like taking on that role? At, like when you no, first started? I was it was more, it was more the, the afraid of like, you know, it was more the fear of like what taking five years off of a career would do for mm. your career. Yeah. You know, that was, that was where the struggle was coming. Cause I'm, I'm not an idiot. I know what it takes to, to, to do well in this business. And I know, you know, how hard one has to work and I know what, you know, I know the, the, what it requires of you. And I was, there was no capable, you know, there was just no space in the day to do any of that. And, yeah. um, and so he, when he said that to me, it was just really helpful. Cause it was like, Oh yeah. Like I'm not my brother who was starting a business at the time. I'm not my other brother who just, you know, was doing whatever he was doing. And I'm not like, I'm the family at this point. I'm the one, I'm the one who stepped into this role. I did, I chose to do it. So do it like be fully there, be there, yeah. you know? And, and it, I'm talking about it. Like it, like I, I, I mean, I just, it, I would cycle and, you know, we're not all, we're not one, we don't make a decision. And then we're like, all oh, all that thing. It's like, I made that decision the day she got diagnosed I made that decision, you know, I was like, and there were these certain moments during that time where I would, I would come back, I would sort of slip back into this, like, oh my God, I'm not doing any, you know, I'm not doing any music. Will I ever do music again? Like, you know, and so that, those were those moments where hearing things like be the, be the, be the family, Kate, you know, really helped me be like, you know, especially year four, year four and a half, year five, where I'm like, wow. <laughs> 
That has been, you know, I mean, I think the kicker was like after my mom died, I was somewhere and it was so great. I mean, it's so laughable. I was somewhere after my mom died, but not, not very, it was like quite soon after she died. I was somewhere in New York, like seeing a gig and I was, I met someone in the crowd. It was like seeing a friend of mine's gig and the guy was like, I met some dude and the dude was like, Kate shot, Kate shot. And that name seems really familiar. Like man, did you put out a record like a decade ago? And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine how that would feel. Wow, dude. Yeah, I was God. like, yeah, that's me, man, a decade ago. Yep, that was me. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't mean anything mean by it, but oh, wow. Of course not, but wow. right? Like, that was just, that's just like it in a nutshell. I mean, it's laughable. It's laughable now, but like, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's important what you're saying more than you realize. And I know that you've had experience telling your story. And mm -hmm. I think it, it is something that needs to be told because I think in creative fields, not just with music, but across the board, I'm talking about acting, painting, whatever you mm -hmm. want to, you want to call it. Almost always you will meet people who are struggling with something similar, not necessarily, you know, a family member dying, but there is this sort of pressure yeah, from something. life, something. Right. And mm -hmm. there is this guilt that comes over with not being able to, to take it. And I have found, and again, everyone's life is different. I, I can't stress that enough, but I have mm -hmm. found a similarity with people who learn how to accept the reality, but not give in to the reality. Like, well, I'm never going to do this ever again. Yeah. Because you're all by that, by, by that logic, you're also kind of dictating what's going to happen. But I found that those that succeed the most and those that kind of create very interesting things in life mm -hmm. are those who understand like, well, this is what I'm dealing with now and I got to deal with it and I will do whatever I have to do after it's done. Mm -hmm. And I'm again, that depends on who you are, but mm -hmm. I do feel like your story I'm hoping it touches a musician out there because it, it, there's so much pressure to constantly put yourself out there, you know, make the next hit song, always be putting out an album. And right. that, wor that works for some people, but I don't think it works for everybody. And it sucks that everyone's trying to do the exact same thing when everyone should just be focusing on what's important to them and what's in front of them now. I don't know. I'm going way far. No, but, but. I, I hear you. I mean, I think for me, it's like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a human, you know, I'm human first, I'm a musician second, and I'm a singer songwriter third. And yeah. I, don't, I hope I never put the, I hope I never fuck up that order. Mm. Cause otherwise like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, there are plenty of people who do put, put it on, put that order in some other, you know, put it in some other order. And I'm, I'm not interested in being that person. And I'm not, in, I'm, I probably am not interested in being that person's friend. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, like it's called life, like shit yeah. happens. And if you don't show up for your life, like then what kind of person are you? I agree. That's you a know, very profound like, statement. Yeah. Like, and also what kind of art can you make? Cause art yeah. comes from life. And if you're not out there living your life, then what the hell do you have to t tell me about it? Yeah. You know? Or show me about it if you're not out there living it. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering when it was all so said and done mm -hmm. and you had all these notes and I imagine the desire to make music came up right after that guy was like, hey, didn't you put on the album <laughs> like 10 years ago? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Did you ever at all feel weird or at odds with number one getting back into it after so long and number two with using your life experience as the source material for putting mm -hmm. out music like that's a good I'm question and no yeah. one's ever asked me that question i mean i don't think so because i'm like a a very literal songwriter you know very realist songwriter so a lot of my music comes from my life and i'm telling stories um so there were a lot of stories to tell um no, and there, there were just, I think the best way to answer that question, Eddie, is to say that, like, there there were things I needed to say to my mom that no matter how I said them with language in a conversation, with, mm. with in a conversation, in a, in, a, in a back and forth over dinner, in the car, going to the chemo suite, sitting in the chemo suite, like, all those things, no matter how I said them, she didn't, she wasn't getting it. And then the mm. second I wrote a song about it, 
it all changed. And like the, the song I use as the example is nothing I won't bear. I mean, my mom felt so guilty and so ashamed that she gotten cancer. I mean, this is a weird thing that people who've had life limiting illnesses will tell you and you can read about it in memoirs and stuff. You know, they just feel like they're burden. I can understand she, that. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. And she felt that way. And I, and it didn't matter how many times I told her, mom, I want to be here. I chose to be here. Like I moved from New York to be here with you. This is what I'm doing that, you know, it, till the end through it all. Um, I'm doing this and it didn't matter. She still felt that way. And then when I, when she went into her mission and I went away and I wrote the song, nothing I won't bear. And I came back and I played it for her. I mean, she obviously burst into tears, but, but more importantly, she, um, she, we just, she got it. She finally got it. And I never had to have that conversation with her ever again. She, she knew. And so I think that was the, the songs were very pure in that regard and that like, there were things I had to say to her mm. that I that I needed to get through to her and they weren't going through some other way. And there were things I needed to say to death, the actual entity of death that I needed. Yeah. There were things I had to say to that thing, spirit being whatever it is, force. Um, so there's a song called Death Comes Slow that it was exactly like I was talking to death. And then there were things that I had to say um, – to myself, there's a song mm. called "Bright." The, the title track "Bright Nowhere" is a song that comes out of. So of course, I mean, my mom and I aren't mincing words. I'm like, "What? Where do you think you're going to go when you die? Like, what do you think is going to happen?" <laughs> wow, that that's a question that's been asked for thousands of years, and I don't think right. anyone has the answer. Right, and so I was curious, and we talk about it over. We had this conversation for years. And we'd come circle back to it and she'd be like, well, maybe I'm going to do this and maybe I'm going to do that. And maybe, maybe I don't go anywhere. Maybe my spirit just dissolves into. Was your mom religious? Were like both of you religious at all? I mean, we grew up Pis- Episcopalian. Um, okay. And, and that's like so all the denomination. That's non denomination. Not yeah, non denomination. Like very right? mild. Yeah. Mild Christianity. Gotcha. Um, uh, lots of good songs. And, and, um, <laughs> and anyway, so there was like a little bit of that. But she had moved after we were all confirmed and like we had sort of moved away from it as kids. Um, she had sort of moved away from it. But, you know, there was a little flavor of that in there. But there was also I introduced her to the work of of um, uh, Joseph Campbell and, you know, a lot of the Buddhist Buddhism stuff. Joseph Campbell. Is he the astrologer? He's a myth- mythologist. There who, you go. I've very, heard that word. Like, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's awesome. And he basically came up with this idea that like, are you, he's, his, his thinking has become a lot more popular in the last decade or so. Yeah. With, um, the idea of like, follow your bliss. The hero's journey is his big. That's um, right. Okay. That, that yeah. makes sense. My, my girlfriend's an yeah. astrologer, so she constantly uses his name and I, I just assume yeah. he's an astrologer. Sorry. Yeah, Jessica. no, he's, he's, he's a badass. Um, yeah. Continue. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, you know, so anyway, we had this ongoing conversation about where do you go when you're going to, wh- where do you think you're going to go when you die? And then my mom one day turned to me and was like, well, where do you think you're going to go? And I was mm. like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, no, mom, I'm not supposed to answer that yet. I'm not the one who's the answer. Wow. Exactly. Wow. So I was like, you know, I really have no answer. And I'm a songwriter, man. And if I don't know the answer to something, I want to write a song about it because if I went in the process of writing a song about it, I'll figure out the answer to it or I'll come to some, to some insight about it. And so yeah. the song bright nowhere was that attempt to answer that song, answer that question in a song. So this is all a long story to say, like, you know, why did I create that music? Like I created it because there were specific things I had to say, you mm. know, um, did you, uh, did you and your mom ever come up with an answer? Like a, like a decision where both of you were like, all right, this is probably what's going to happen. No, mm-hmm. it's probably the best, the better outcome, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I don't think anyone really knows. And then there is some solemn in uh, not knowing, I guess, but in, in being able to live, you know, until that, that moment, how yeah. crazy I, I don't yeah. know. your, your story is fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know that once your music came out and, you know, you started putting it out there and people started hearing about what you were doing, there was a, people did receive it fairly well. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, um, I guess maybe not in your opinion, but I guess what was the react? When did you realize that what you had made 
was touching people in a way that was special and different from, I would imagine some of your other music that you mm-hmm. have out there, you know, cause this sure. is vastly different. So I'm yeah, wondering yeah. what were those reactions like? And when did you start realizing you were actually touching people in that way? Well, I, I started playing that music, um, you know, the, as soon as I had a handful of songs, whenever I could, I do little house concerts back in New York. And, um, you know, so I started sort of experimenting. This has probably been like the last year of my mom's life. And so I started experimenting with how to play this music in mm. a way that didn't leave everyone in a total puddle of, of, of tears, you know, because that's tricky, right? Like this is, yeah, for sure. Uh, as my producer, Rob Mounsey says, like, you know, like we're, we're making, he would always say when we were making the record, he'd be like, yeah, you know, we're making this record. It's all about death, but it's not a downer. It's not a downer. Like there's some really poignant songs in there, but it's not a total downer. So it was like yeah. how to, how to craft a show that told the story and brought you through a, a lot of it, but didn't leave you in a really like, you know, sad, um, hopeless place. Um, so I think it was then that I started to play a few of these songs and saw the reaction of people outside of my mom and, you know, how it allowed really, I, I think the, the turning point was I played a gig. It was probably right at, right close to when she died or after she died. I played a gig at, um, I mean, um, what's the name of that club? The rock at Rockwood in mm, New York. Okay. And, yeah. um, I love that venue. Yeah. It's a great venue. And I, and afterwards I had like a line of people, coming up to talk to me and say like, I, Oh, you know, uh, this friend had cancer and this is how it affected me. And this friend had cancer and this is how it affected me. And Oh my God, I did the same thing you did for my mom, but 20 years ago. And Mm. like, it was just every single person had to come up to me and every person had a cancer story, which was really terrible and devastating. But like, wow, you kind of realize that how, how much of a scourge cancer is like you you probably can't find a person on the face of this earth who hasn't been affected by it in less than six degrees somehow. Um, and so I think it was then that I realized, Oh, Oh, okay. You know, and really I, I also, I wanted another reason why I wrote the songs is because I want every, I, I had this experience when I was taking care of my mom that people didn't know how to, treat me you know they were like oh, i don't want to make i don't want to bring it up i don't want to talk you know like so i felt as though i was in a vacuum a lot of times um because they didn't want to disturb me they didn't want to bring it up they didn't want to ask me they didn't know what to say because no, our culture does the shittiest job of teaching people how to deal with loss and grief yes it does yes yeah, yeah, so does. so i was i was left in this weird vacuum except for in, except for like one or two friends who who really showed up for me and And so what I saw was that like, if the songs acted like a little key in a lock and that like the song is a way that when you don't know what to say, you can send it to someone and say like, Mm. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I heard the song. I know you're going through something tough, you know? Interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's how I, I also knew that that was possible and that that was happening. Um, and so I was, that's when I saw that it was like change, it was able to change the conversation or lack thereof really around loss and grief. And so that's yeah. when I was like, okay, game on, like, this is something I want to do. And, and I want to like actually take it to cancer support communities and to house concerts of people who've lost someone recently. And what a beautiful a, thing. Yeah. That is awesome because you're, you're absolutely right. Like full disclaimer, I actually just um, experienced death in my family too. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Wow. That son just came out of nowhere. As I said that, I that see? is, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is not a coincidence, no. uh, but you know, the, the it's, it's COVID related obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, while, while it isn't, an easy thing to deal with. It is interesting how you, you bring that up, how in our culture, specifically, I want to say specifically American culture. I don't, I don't want to speak from other cultures, you know, but I do find that we, um, we don't take pain very easily. And it's one of those things we just don't want to talk about it. And if we do talk about it, it's about 
how terrible it is. You know, like there's really no upside to it. When you yeah. look at a lot of other cultures, um, you know, a lot of cultures, I don't know which ones at the top of my head, so I don't want to say which ones, but mm-hmm. I know that there, a lot of funerals can be celebrations, you know, celebrating someone's yeah, life. Yeah, there's rituals. There's exactly. There's ways to get through it. it it's... <laughs> Do you watch, do you, have you ever seen a show called The Midnight Gospel on Netflix? No. Uh-uh. Okay. There's this, it's made by Duncan Trussell, who's a very successful comedian and podcaster, but cool. such a beautiful show. If you haven't seen it, and I oh, I've mentioned this a couple of times before to you guys, you guys need to watch the show. The last yeah. episode of the first season is about um, his mom's death. And, and to give you a perspective, this show is, a, is basically a podcast like we're doing now. But cool. what they do is they take this podcast from this famous podcaster and they animate it and the animations have nothing to do with the podcast. So it creates this bizarre experience where you're listening to a conversation and the, there's these weird creatures doing weird ass shit. It is the it's cool. beautiful show. You need to watch it. Anyways, yeah, I'll watch it. The, the last episode, it's this interview that he had with his mom who passed away. And very similar to you, you know, they knew she was going to die and they're having this conversation about um, just like understanding and acceptance of, of the death and how there's like a cycle and all that. Anyways, my, I completely lost my train of thought, but um, okay, <laughs> you might, you might remember it, but my hope, I think where I was going with this was, was how works like that, like that episode and your music, in my opinion, what you mentioned earlier is very important, how unfortunately we do live in a in a world in a, in a country where death is not easy and it's not okay mm-hmm. but music and like episodes like that one who I, I sent that episode to my sister by the way who also experienced death of one of her friends mm. and it's interesting how the reaction afterwards is like hey thank you for sending me that and that's right. all I need to hear it's just very simply like they dealt with it they needed that and it's cool how art can be that bridge without yeah, you having exactly. to say anything you know what it's i mean it's the key it's the little key that unlocks something that's like sort of un you know you can't open the door without it yeah for that's some so, people for some yeah people. yeah mm-hmm. for some people god that yeah. that sounds so bright <laughs> it's like right in my face but anyways i think it's beautiful and i love your story i know we we kind of went a little bit over the uh, over time but word man we got into it we got into I, it deep i know we did i i, I appreciate <laughs> you being open to expressing your story because at the end of the day, very much like art helps to connect and help us deal with stuff. I think conversations and being honest is one of the most important things we can do as well, helping to share ideas and just learn from each other. And um, I know that you are succeeding and you are doing some pretty cool stuff. You, you did a Ted talk, which is pretty cool. I think that's something a lot of us want to do. How was that like? Yeah, that came out of, that came out of someone following my journey, basically of, of caring for my mom um, on my blog and, um, basically inviting me to do that talk. And, you know, I was like, Oh, with not a lot of time. And I was like, Oh my God, am I going to do this? But, you know, I really had something I wanted to say about, you know, how to treat people who are going through grief and loss and, and like some easy, real easy tips to, to make it easier for them. Yeah. Um, so that was amazing. And that was an incredible experience. I'm so glad I did it. And, you know, it's been so, I still regularly get emails and comments from people, you know, saying like, wow, this, re- this really helped me. I- I'm just, you know. I've it was really well person. done. It was beautiful, by the way. Thank it was you. Great. Thank you. I'm wondering, is this, do you feel like you're going to explore this theme more and more with your career? You know, I have, I don't, I never say things like this, but there, there's, you know, there's just, I'm, I'm definitely gifted somehow in the ability through this experience with my mom, I'm, I'm able to talk about this stuff, uh, about loss and grief in a way that's very, um, I don't know, that gets through. Mm. I mean, I have people all in my life who are like, you should, you should quit this music shit and become like a, become a person who like teaches the whole world how to die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm kind of doing that with my music, but um, the death guru, you're going to become a death yeah, guru. Totally. But it's true. There's like some, some way in which I have a comfort around it. That's, that's quite, um, you know, uh, that's not normal. <laughs> I don't think like in our society. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm always down to show up for people in, in however they need me to show up. I mean, I, I've, you know, you may have seen somewhere in my stuff that I'm a life coach. And, um, 
a, a number of my clients do as we work together, you know, life happens. We're working together for a year or more and somebody dies in their life. And, you know, they, especially COVID now, um, you know, that it's like, if I'm able to help them in that regard, I, I, I hope so, because it doesn't have to be as hard as, as our culture makes it be. Yeah. There it's is part peace. of life. There yeah, is peace. It's part of life. There is peace. We're all going to die. It's a fact of life, you know, burying our head in the sands, in the sand doesn't do, doesn't make it any, doesn't make it not happen. Exactly. Um, yeah. So you're still going to deal with it. So you're going to deal with it. And you know, there's, there's pain in life, as you said earlier, there's always going to be pain, but there doesn't have to be suffering. Yeah, I agree. Kate, you're a wonderful person. You're a great speaker and you have a <laughs> very you. fascinating story. Like I said, I do appreciate you being open, honest oh, yeah. about this. It's totally. been quite a pleasure talking to you to end things off. I know we kind of already touched on it, but um, what are your plans here on out? Any new music? I know you're a life coach. I know yeah. there's a lot of things you might be doing. I don't know. So give me the logo. Yeah. Um, going on? Well, the record comes out right nowhere. It comes out on streaming on Friday, which is, I don't know when people will hear this, but soon end of April. Um, so we're psyched about that. You know, I released it um, not on streaming first. So, so sort of the, the fans, the, the, the tribe could get it first and now we're releasing it to the world on streaming. So that's exciting. I'm really excited for, that music to be out there and to for people to hear it and have it help them and unlock some doors for them. Um, always doing some co-writing. Um, got a, a project with a great songwriter named Steve Seskin, Nashville guy, and he and I have been working together for a while. We're almost done with a handful of songs enough to make a record maybe. So nice. Hope hope to do that. Um, working on my next record as well. And um, yeah, coaching, always coaching people and you know, just trying to, uh, be a good person, be kind and show up for the people in my life that are important and, um, you know, go all in with pluck and zeal. Basically that's my, that's my life motto. So I'm trying to do yeah. that. I love it. That's beautiful. I think, uh, you definitely grabbed life by the horns. Now, I'm not mm. stealing that from Dodge. <laughs> Don't sue me. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, what a great slogan. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> but um, anyways, Kate, yeah, thank you so awesome. much for taking time out of your day. You're awesome. And I'm glad Appreciate we got a chance it, to talk. Buddy. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. We'll speak soon, I hope. Anytime. Okay. All right, stay you right will. there. Don't hang up just yet. Uh, that was great. How'd you like it? So great. Awesome, man. Great interview. You're a great interviewer. You have such a... A uh, kind and open um, way about you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. I think uh, at the end of the day, part of the reason why my stuff stands out is I don't, I think a lot of the podcasts that you might have done and other people do, they people just tend to want to be the devil's advocate. I, I just want to talk to people and just explore life for what the beauty that it has to offer. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's just me. That's just me naturally. So I'm glad I made you feel comfortable. I'm glad you opened oh, up. Yeah. It's very beautiful. So great. I hope we get to do it again.